you know, our flocks were running through the, the carnage of the canal that was, you know, full of blood and body parts. And the 82nd Airborne soldiers would just pick them up right out of the canal. My parents said I came out of the sandbox at like age four and said I wanted to be a commando, uh, even though I didn't know what that meant really. I think I was probably playing with GI Joes. I enlisted in the Wisconsin National Guard as a combat engineer. And I did the National Guard while I was in college with the original plan of going active duty once I graduated from college. I wanted to be originally a special forces engineer sergeant. Um, and then my father, um, talked me into switching to becoming an officer and going through ROTC, I think my junior or senior year. So I commissioned in 2006. What does the Army expect of you before they make you a Green Beret? What do you have to achieve either physically, mentally, or otherwise? So in my case as an officer, you have to do a couple years in the regular Army before you can even qualify. Um, and then you have to put together a resume. So many people who put together a resume with the request of going to special forces selection don't even get accepted to the tryout. Um, there's a series of physical requirements. Um, basically you're trying to make your resume look better than any other officer who's applying. So when you were first deployed, you went to Iraq, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, when was that and where did they send you in Iraq? So I deployed uh, as part of the surge with the 3rd Infantry Division, uh, 2007 to 2009. I was in Baghdad, Iraq, southern Baghdad, in a neighborhood called Sadia. Uh, I volunteered to be a combat advisor, and we were part of a 16-month deployment in that area of operations. So I was part of a 12-man team uh, of different occupational spe specialties, and we were there to advise and assist the, uh, the Iraqi Army Battalion. So we lived in a small outpost in the middle of, uh, out in the middle of the area of operations in sector, right next to our Iraqi battalion. So we were there eating with them every day, training with them. Uh, we would help train them on a variety of skills and tasks, and then we would go out with them uh, to conduct operations. Sometimes we would do that um, unilaterally, just us and the Iraqi battalion. Other times we would work uh, with our Iraqi battalion and the U.S. Army units in sector. You know, a 16-month deployment, there were many periods of, long periods of boredom, um, interrupted by moments of sheer terror. So our battalion lost 12 individuals, I believe, um, amongst, our, amongst our battalion. So there was violence, but not at the scale, frequency, and intensity of what I saw in Afghanistan. Uh, the first time you get shot at is uh, a little disbelief uh, and then quickly followed by anger. Um, you know, they would hit us with, and the difficulty we had in, in Iraq is we were in a city, so very hard to know where the fire is coming from, very hard to really maneuver when you don't know uh, where a sniper is in place, where the mortars are coming from, sounds are uh, muffled. Um, just a very difficult environment to, to fight in, especially with a small element like ours. So oftentimes the best we could do is um, lay down fire and break contact. And then after you left Iraq in 2009, what happened next? Uh, I went home and I, I contemplated leaving the military, but I still had unfinished business to do. So I applied for and got an opportunity to go to Special Forces Selection in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Went there, I was selected, and I went to the Special Forces Q, Q course, which I completed. What's, what does that involve? Uh, first por portion is one, going through selection, which when I went through, I think it was 24 days, um, a series of individual physical fitness events, then you go through a, a land navigation course called the STAR course and followed by a, a team week, which is a series of grueling exercises that you complete with a, with a squad. Uh, once you get to the Special Forces Q course, you have language school. Uh, for me, I was trained in Spanish, but there's multiple other languages that individuals are trained on depending which group they go to. Then SUT, which is small unit tactics. And then you will go to your MS, MOS portion so there's the engineers, the uh, weapon sergeants, uh, communications, and medical, uh, and then the officers. So I went to the officer portion. And then after that, we all went through a large culmination exercise called Robin Sage, which is 
uh, spread out across Western North Carolina. Green Berets are known for unconventional warfare. Um, a lot of people, we have multiple missions that we complete, but our primary focus is unconventional warfare. And that typically is a long-term um, progression, which involves operating, not just operating behind enemy lines, but living behind enemy lines, working with an indigenous force or host nation, um, using auxiliary, auxiliary elements, underground elements, um, trying to blend in as best that you can. And that's really where like the language and cultural skills uh, come into play. When did you go to Afghanistan? I went to Afghanistan in 2012. And as a Green Beret, where, were, where did they put you to, to kind of build these relationships with the indigenous people? So the mission I was working as a Green Beret in Afghanistan was called uh, VSO, Village Stability Operations. So we were living in a small outpost up in the mountains. Uh, it was an air-only site, so we had to be resupplied by helicopters or airdrops. Uh, there was really no way to get to us uh, just because of the large IED threat. Um, what we were doing as part of this uh, village stability operations was we were living with the villagers. Uh, there were three villages that we were kind of located in the center of. Uh, we were there to build security, governance, and development in these three villages. Uh, we were operating on the philosophy of uh, Pashtun Wali, which is this um, philosophy or value system of the Pashtun tribe, whereas they will invite you in and they will kind of offer you protection. Um, so we were there working alongside the, the various villagers. We had an Afghan special forces team attached with us and just trying to recruit the people to fight back the Taliban, to support the Afghan government, and then start bringing in uh, developmental organizations like education, uh, medical services, things of that nature. You obviously forged some very strong relationships mm -hmm. over there, so talk about how those got developed. Well, as a special forces you know, commander, or special forces just in, real, in general, you are working very closely with your interpreter. Uh, so my interpreter was basically my shadow for most of the days. I would have a, we had four different interpreters on our team. Uh, we had two American citizens that were interpreters. Uh, they were much more fluent in English, so we would typically use them for our key leader engagements where conversations were a lot more nuanced. Uh, as in regards to our um, Afghan-born interpreters, they were much younger, much fitter. So we typically took them out on combat patrols because they had the physical capabilities to get up the mountains, move around in a firefight. Um, so we became very close with them. Um, you know, as we were getting shot at, my interpreter was right next to me. As we were kind of um, laying down behind rocks, taking cover, he was right there with me. So it was almost like a, a kid brother to me. I kind of had to drag him around a lot of times and try to keep him safe. And you obviously developed relationships within your own military personnel, and one that we've interviewed before is is Scott Mann. Talk about uh, your relationship with him and, and how that has developed over time. So Scott and I are both from uh, Seven Special Forces Group. I actually did not know Scott before Task Force Pineapple. I knew his name. You know, it's a small community. He knew my name. We had mutual uh, colleagues and friends, uh, but we'd never actually spoken together. And uh, when Afghanistan started to fall apart in July, I had reached back out to my interpreter and some of my Afghan Special Forces colleagues to help get them out of Afghanistan. And I was trying with my local congressional representatives, I was trying to go through the State Department and I just kept running into roadblock after roadblock. And I posted on LinkedIn, um, hey, this is a Hail Mary, does anyone know how to get people out of Afghanistan? And uh, a gentleman by the name of Kurt hit me up um, on LinkedIn via a direct message saying, hey, I'm part of this this new group we're forming called Task Force Pineapple, would you like to join us? It's full of other Navy SEALs and Green Berets and Rangers, uh, and we think that you know we can help get your guys out. And I said, sure. And uh, we all formed up in a, either a WhatsApp chat room and started kind of planning the operation together. There was about, about 20 of us at the time when I joined, and Scott was the, the leader of the group. We were, you know, looking over maps, kind of trying to figure out a way to, to crack the nut, if you will. Um, and Scott Mann, who was really the, the leader of the organization, um, just kind of threw out an open challenge to all of us of like, hey, let's take a look at this, you know, let's brainstorm what we can come up with and let me know if anyone has any good ideas. 
and when I initially got into the room, I saw all the names of the people in the room, and I knew these names, uh, even though I did not know them personally, but they were kind of a who's who, a, a legends list of the special operations community. So I, I felt very intimidated by the, uh, the other gentlemen in the room, um, guys like the, by the name of Jim Gant, who was the, the Lawrence of Afghanistan, uh, Perry Blackburn, Mark, Mark Nutch, who were the horse soldiers, Jason Redman, uh, the, the list goes on. Um, so I really didn't want to speak up, actually. I was kind of, you know, I was kind of intimidated by the other guys in the room, even though, like, I had been to Iraq and Afghanistan and, and all that. Uh, so we, we were just looking at it for a while, and I, I don't know how much time uh, elapsed between Scott throwing out that challenge before I had an idea. And so I, I teach eighth grade social studies in the city of Syracuse. And I teach usually the mid-Civil War, end of the Civil War, to about the 1980s. So one of the areas that I talk about is the Underground Railroad with Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman retired uh, to Auburn, uh, New York, which is just outside of Syracuse. So she's a very big deal there. And, uh, you know, she was, she was the Underground Railroad. I guess one of the, you would say the, the face of the Underground Railroad. And I have a post over her on, on my classroom wall. And that kind of popped in my head and I just threw out to Scott, like, what if we did like kind of an underground railroad um, concept to get people through, through, through a hole in the wall, if we can find one uh, of the airport. And uh, then I threw out um, a request, does anyone have any contacts with anyone on the inside of the air, airport? And someone had a phone number for a captain in the 82nd Airborne. And I reached out with, with him and I just kind of, uh, tried the best I could to build rapport and feel him out and see if he would be open to helping us with this and he was and we just we just kind of went from there. When you say a hole in the wall at the airport, does that mean the people you brought didn't go through the, the gates like everybody else? You had a, a different way of getting them in? Yes, that's correct. Uh, there was a small gap in the perimeter of the 82nd Airborne um, lines on the eastern side of the airport. Uh, the airport was surrounded with like uh, T walls or cement walls, and there was just a small gap um, where they could get people through, and that's what we used to to sneak people into the airport. Was there any sort of priority list of who gets out first, or is it just a matter of who can get to the starting point in the Underground Railroad? First? Yeah, it was really to who could get in position first, because we had people spread out. They were coming from different points in the city, and the Taliban had checkpoints throughout the city, and that was really the, the hardest thing for uh, all of our flocks, really. Um, my own personal flocks tried three days in a row to get to the link-up point, but were unsuccessful because the Taliban would you know, beat women, beat children, beat the men. Um, they were using belts from, um, from cars, pipes, whatever, and most of our flocks were not able to navigate those checkpoints. I mean, it's hard enough for me to go on vacation with my two sons. Uh, I couldn't imagine trying to navigate Taliban checkpoints um, with five, six kids, all under the age of five. So many of our flocks were unable to, to reach the link up point. So the ones that were, were able to get to the link up, link, up, link up point, we would stage them there. And then I would communicate with the, the soldiers of the 82nd. Um, we'd put them in place. We would give them directions on how to reach up. This was all being conducted under, the, the, under darkness. Um, so the Taliban couldn't see, but also so other Afghans couldn't see because once word got out that there was a hole in the wall, there probably would have been, been a mad rush. So we had to be very slow, very de deliberate, um, kind of like moving chess pieces around a board. So uh, we would give them directions, you know, go parallel down the canal. Once you reach these connexes, you're going to see a bridge. Um, on that bridge, I want you to look for, a, one night it was a green chem light, uh, another night it was a red headlamp that the captain was wearing around his, uh, around his throat. So they would reach that. Once they got close, uh, the far recognition signal, uh, they would flash, a, flash their cell phone, uh, the light on their cell phone, and then once they got close, they would hold up the cell phone to uh, the member of the 82nd Airborne, which was a, a pineapple pattern. Um, once the 82nd Airborne members uh, collected them, they would take them on the inside of the wall, 
And at that point, they would verify their identity, all their paperwork, and then shuttle them to inside the airport to get on a flight. Now, one of your biggest nights, I think the biggest night, in fact, you get about 500 people through, or maybe that was a cumulative total. I'll, I'll let you correct that in a minute if that's wrong. Uh, was right around the time of the terrorist blast near the Abbey Gate. So, talk about what was happening with your operation at that point and how that attack affected everything. Yeah. So, on the the third night of our our larger operations, we we ended up getting about 500 through, but we started with well more than that. We weren't able to achieve getting everyone through through that that evening. What happened that night is we had so many flocks that we had accumulated and, and at that point uh, Task Force Fi Pineapple had um, grown just over a course of a night of bringing in more Green Berets and more seals uh, that were trying to get their friends out so we almost doubled in the number of flocks that we were trying to get out. And our, our plan for that evening was to wait right for when the sun went down and then as quickly as possible uh, start shuttling people through through the hole in the wall. So we had people staged all throughout the, the eastern side of the city, somewhere up to about a mile away, you know, at a gas station, sitting in their car, just waiting for um, communication from their shepherd to start moving to the staging point. Uh, what happened that, that evening that made things especially difficult was um, the desperation and panic really started to set in amongst the Afghan people. So just thousands of people were crowding the Abbey Gate to the point that they were backed up all the way down the canal um, and they were covering the hole in the wall from the, from the 82nd. So we couldn't get anyone through the wall without uh, any other Afghans noticing. So we had to wait for the crowd to disperse. So we were looking at a variety of other means of deception to try to convince people to move to another gate. So we were going on, we had people with Twitter accounts that were saying, hey, the, the Western gate is open, you know, trying to get people to move to the Western gate. And then we, we had ISR assets that we were able to actually view to see our people actually moving kind of thing. So we lost a few hours there just waiting for people to disperse. Um, and then once they did, we were able to start moving people into uh, through the hole in the wall again. However, we, we quickly realized that we, we were going to run out of time. And we had been coordinating with uh, other um, government officials on the inside um, of HKIA, you know, some State Department folks, some other, uh, the Marine Corps. So at that point, you know, we, we kind of told them, hey, you know, we've got way many, too many people to get through this gate. At some point um, throughout the operation, they actually were sending people to us to get through via our mechanism because they couldn't get them through the, the standard gates, either West Gate, East Gate, or Abbey Gate. And I realized that we weren't going to get everyone through the hole in the wall, so we, we decided collectively that we need to try to move them and you know go through a, one of the main gates. But we had, no other, we had no other contacts other than our captain in the 82nd. So again, we had to reach out to our personal networks to see if we could find anyone who had a cell phone number from someone on the inside. Eventually, we were able to get in contact with uh, the captain of the of Abbey Gate from the Marine Corps. Uh, he and I spoke. Um, I decided to move all of our flocks right into Abbey Gate and push them right up to the front and see if we could get them in through the gate. You know, I told him the, the signal that we were using. Um, he was in an agreement, um, but we needed approval. Um, then we, we ended up speaking with a, a three-star general on the inside. Um, we coordinated that, but again, we needed a higher level of approval. And then our people ended up sitting there for four hours while we waited for approval. And at that point, the Taliban had really, really intensified uh, their violence. Um, the heat was picking up. We were, we were losing a lot of flocks that just couldn't endu endure it anymore. And um, at that point, the, the crowd had started to dissipate by the 80, over by the 82nd lines. So we made the decision to move them back again down the canal um, to the 82nd. Um, and about five to ten minutes after we made the decision, to pull them out of Abbey Gate is when the, the blast occurred. And we did lose a family um, from that blast. Um, after that blast off, went off is kind of 
you know, time was running out, especially. So the 82nd Airborne uh, was gracious enough just to go basically go over um, instead of just doing onesies and twosies through the wall. They moved out to the, the top of their positions. They moved out onto the bridge and we just told them anyone who comes running down holding up a cell phone with a pineapple on it you know, grab them up. And that's what they did. You know, our flocks were running through the, the carnage of the canal that was, you know, full of blood and body parts. And the 82nd Airborne soldiers would just pick them up right out of the canal and bring them to safety. Uh, we were able to coordinate with the, the British Army as well. Um, so the, the Brits picked up a lot of pe people. Um, and then eventually we were able to coordinate with the Marines. And some of the Marines were able to pick up a few of our flocks as well. Zach, what is the situation now? The military is not there anymore. For those who could get to the airport, there's still thousands of Afghan allies that are there. I know the effort goes on, but obviously it must have changed a lot. Yeah, so we switched to, um, you know, now we're covering all of Afghanistan, trying to get them out through a variety of means. Um, right now, the situation is pretty dire. Um, these individuals have been displaced. Many of them left their homes in July or August thinking they were gonna, gonna get on a flight out of Kabul, and now they can't go back to their villages because the Taliban have moved in. Uh, they essentially, they have the, the roster number of all the commandos and special forces units and who were interpreters. So they went to the village elders and said, hey, you know, point out the individuals who are part of these units, or they went to, you know, neighbors are turning on neighbors kind of thing. So these individuals can't go home. They're spread out in hole up sites. They're staying with family. They're, you know, trying to stay in hotels. Many of them are living on the streets um, and they're not prepared for what's coming and winter is coming. So trying to prevent a massive uh, humanitarian crisis is a, a massive difficulty for us right now. Another major difficulty, we, difficulty we have is many countries won't accept them. You know, other countries will accept doctors and lawyers and women's rights advocates um, because they're easily employable, but they don't want to accept Afghan commandos and Afghan special forces soldiers for whatever reason. So they're stuck. Um, another issue we're running into is in order to get on a flight there, you have to have a passport. Most Afghans don't have passports. Uh, the borders of Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Pakistan are closed. Um, there's Taliban on one side and soldiers on the other side. So trying to get them overland um, is also a very difficult issue. And then we're also running into the issue of even if we do get them out of the country, what nation will actually accept them? So if we get them over the border, we can't support them because we don't have the, the network that we have on the ground in Afghanistan. Many of the people that are supporting us on the ground in Afghanistan are our former friends and allies. These are special forces soldiers and commandos who, who have agreed to stay behind in order to help you know, their friends and colleagues get out. And then eventually, once enough people get out, they will get out as well. So they're really you know, putting, continuing to put their lives on the line for us um, to help us get others out. We don't have a resolution with all of your flock at this point. What's the status? Uh, I was able to get my interpreter out. Um, he got out on the second night of H. Kaya. Uh, he went to Fort Pickett, Virginia, was processed there, and he lives 20 minutes away from me now in Syracuse. So um, he's you know, ecstatic to be in the United States. He wants to get working. Um, the community of Syracuse has been amazing. So in regards to his story, you know, that's a happy ending. And I know he and his family are going to go on and do great things and become great Americans. Uh, one of my special forces colleagues was gunned down, um, trying to make a run for the Tajikistan border about two days after H. Kaya. He was a Hazara. Hazaras are typically marginalized and, and the Taliban killed him and his family. Uh, two other individuals, uh, they and their families are in hole up sites. Um, just waiting for us to try to get some kind of support to get them out. You know, sharing the, uh, the, the bonds of brotherhood or whatever you want to call it uh, with someone, you know, I don't know if there's a chemical change that, you know, if you're in combat with someone, regardless of race, creed, religion, or color, but it kind of bonds you together. And there's always that, that poem uh, from Shakespeare, 
the St. Crispin Day speech, uh, the Band of Brothers speech that most people call it. And he who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother now until the end. Uh, so thinking of that speech and just thinking of the guys that I served with, um, having the opportunity that getting them out to, to repay them for their, their loyalty and service to us it was kind of what I was thinking of.